everybody welcome back to my youtube channel my name is alicia elizabeth and i am so excited that you decided to join me here today <sighs> i'm just feeling a bunch of emotions um so bear with me if you are new to this channel welcome 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 i would encourage you to subscribe at the end of watching this video if and only if you like what you've heard if you are a returning viewer hey boo hey you all we have finished Dr. Brene Brown's Gifts of Imperfection book. And I just, I can't believe it. Like, I can't believe it. So I have a couple things that I want to go over today. This video is a wrap up of the book. Um, as I mentioned in my last video, this is not the last video for the Wholehearted Living series. I have about two or three more videos that'll come and then we will be on to the next book but before I go into my agenda of things that I want to talk about I just really want to say thank you I want to say thank you to everyone who has watched these videos commented on the videos liked the videos shared the videos and subscribed by way of seeing the videos you all have been phenomenal and so so encouraging um like there are just not enough words to express just how grateful I am for the people who joined my series at different points in times that inboxed me and shared, you know, hey, that really touches home. I'm low key, high key embarrassed. And I just, I just, I just can't, I just cannot thank you enough. I'm going to read something um, that Brene said at the very beginning of this book that I believe I mentioned in one of the first videos. She said, how much we know and understand ourselves is critically important, but there is something that is even more essential to living a wholehearted life, loving ourselves. She says, knowledge is important, but only if we're being kind and gentle with ourselves as we work to discover who we are. Wholeheartedness is as much about embracing our tenderness and vulnerability as it is about developing knowledge and claiming power. And so... Throughout this series, you all have been getting a ton of information, a ton of gems, alongside me sharing my personal experiences and understanding of the book and the way it relates and application opportunities to where you can apply it to your life. And so I just want to I just want to really say thank you. Like, thank you for going the distance with me. Thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for just even telling me at random, like, I can relate to that. Like, that is so encouraging. So that's the first thing. I just want to say thank you. I'm probably going to be saying thank you throughout the entire video. Secondly, I have decided to create some shirts. I feel like there were so many words and phrases and ideas that resonated with me while I was reading this text that I'm like, you know what? I want to create different pieces, whether it's a shirt, a baseball cap, a journal, a mug. I'm still working on those things. But the, the message that Brene did a great job of delivering in her book really echoes my personal agenda when it comes to helping people on my channel and the videos that you all will continue to see. So I want to be completely honest with you. I have not ordered one of my own shirts yet. Okay, I will be ordering them today when I finish this video um, because I will have officially posted the site with the shirts that you can order from. I'm going to include a video clip, if I can, of some of the shirts. The link will be below in the description box. Um, and it will also be on every platform that I am on, Facebook, Instagram, and my blog. All of that information will be below. But I want to encourage you to buy a shirt not only because, of course, I will be super grateful for that, but because um, I want you to see it as a shirt that is you owning something that you're choosing to do that Brene has encouraged or, taught, or that we talked about on this channel. So the way I'm spinning it, because I haven't owned a shirt, I don't want to promote an item that I can't promise you the guarantee of what it will look and feel like. And I believe in being honest with you. So at the very minimum, you should see this as a potential pajama shirt, something that you wear around in your house. It could be um, in the privacy of your home. You can cut it up. You know, sometimes when I have t-shirts that I'm not too fond of, I'll cut it right here. Or I'll cut it off the shoulder. But nonetheless, I want you to support the t-shirts that I've created and the hoodies and different things that you'll find on my website as um, items. And they are, I think the word is um, statement pieces that hone in on where you are in your journey in wholehearted living. 
even if you don't purchase, it's no big deal. But I wanted to put that out there because if I'm going to be completely honest with you, it was something that I've been thinking about since the middle of this series. And I think some level of wanting to perfect it got in the way. And so I told myself when I was making this video that I'm going to be honest with you all about the fact that I had not created the shirts in time to order it, to wear it, and to show you, you know, how it looks, how it feels. But I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to do what I said I was going to do for myself. And so again, um, I will be ordering from these shirts, from the shirt pile. But I want to encourage you to check out the items that I've created, um, inspired by this book and inspired by the personal work that I'm doing in my life. And I want you to have an open mind that at the very minimum, this can be a shirt that you wear at home to, uh, to bed or that you throw on on a comfortable day. After I receive my shirt, of course, I will maybe talk about the ways you can wear it and boast about what's good about it and things like that. But if you want to support it today, as we come to a close um, in this series, feel free to check that store link out below in my description box. Okay, so we've gone through the gratitude. Um, I mentioned the merchandise that you all can pick up. Um, I want to encourage you to share this video. I want people to get into the series, especially if you've made it all the way through. And... Comment below, I wanna to talk to you. Now, in this video, the goal is to share with you 15 things that Brene taught me or that I'm taking away, because Brene done taught me a lot of things, okay? Um, but just 15 things that really resonated with me and then um, I'll close and I would love, like as always, I would love to hear what resonated with you as well. Um, I mentioned in the last video that the next couple videos, which will close out the series, includes me talking to some of my friends who reached out and was following along with the series or, you know, a video or two or five videos spoke to them. So we're just going to do like a little, I don't want to say round table, but round table discussion. Um, so I have a couple of those and then we will go into our next book. I will talk to you about that if I have time at the end of this video. If not, I will share it in another video, possibly Slow Down Sunday, something like that. Okay, so let's get into it. First and foremost, the first lesson that Brene's um, book taught me is that I am worthy today, that I am enough, and that there are no prerequisites to being worthy. I love this lesson because it is the foundation of understanding all the other gems that Brene talks about. In order for us to practice compassion, courage, authenticity, storytelling, shame, resiliency, creating work that has meaning, rest, play, all these good things. We have to know that at the very base of who we are, we are worthy. And so if that's something you don't know, it's something you really have to learn and start telling yourself that I am worthy today whether I lose another pound. I'm worthy today whether I make less or more money. I'm worthy today if I never choose to be an entrepreneur. I'm worthy if I never become a mom, if I never become a wife. I am worthy. And so often our society makes us feel like we aren't worthy until we've obtained something. And that is an absolute lie. Number two, vulnerability isn't optional. It's mandatory in showing up for myself and for others. I wrote down my list because I didn't want to just be all over the place. I realized that Right before this, um, right before I started this series, I was confronted with someone who was really near and dear to me um, that basically was like, listen, you're not being vulnerable in this space. And I'm like, yo, what are you talking about? Yes, I am. I share all my business with you. And it wasn't until he called me out and I started reading this book that I'm like, no, it's one thing to just share, to participate in the conversation. It's another thing to really show some skin. It's another thing to really put your whole entire body in the game, right? And so um, my number two says vulnerability isn't optional. It's mandatory in showing up for myself and for others. It is mandatory if I want healthy, whole, sustainable um, thriving relationships in my life. Vulnerability has to be something that I see as a necessary piece, a necessary component. It is not optional. Number three, life is too precious to not do the work on ourselves. No more pleasing, performing, and perfecting. So there's another quote in the book, and I only have three because I don't want to keep going through the book. We done did this for weeks, but some things stood out to me. Brene said, I learned how to worry more about how I felt and less about what people might think. I was setting new boundaries and began to let go of my need to please perform and perfect. This statement embodies 
where I am. I don't want to say that I'm someone who has never cared about what people have thought, but I will say that since I've left home, moved to Columbus, Ohio, and was in a place by myself, I'm still in Columbus, um, where I don't have my immediate family and friends around me, I learned to make decisions for myself. I've learned to question, you know, okay, Alicia, who who's making an impression on you right now? Like, who is causing you to feel uncomfortable in your decision? Right. And so I love this so much because throughout this book, I feel like that muscle that maybe I kind of just got laxed about was being strengthened again, kind of to the point of like, I'm going to do what I want to do courageously, out loud, boldly. And I don't care about pleasing, performing or perfecting things to please people. Right. Or to be found in favor of someone or a group or organization. And so I really, really love that. And so my number three is life is too precious to not do the work on ourselves. Life is too precious to just go with the flow or do what we've always done and do what people tell us to do. I mean, yes, we should listen to our wise counsel, but it's too precious for you not to take the quality time to really assess yourself and do the inner work, okay? Um, number four, when we trade our authenticity in for approval, we begin hustling for our worth. This is my favorite. And I'm not going to get emotional, but I can feel it. I think this, this point is my favorite because I keep thinking about people in my life who did not meet the mark that I knew they could meet. Get on chunk that. Wait a minute. <laughs> And not like in a disappointment recalling, but just like, I wish I knew what I know now for the relationships that I had the opportunity to come across because I would call them out and say, hey, you are compromising because you are seeking my approval or you're seeking someone else's approval. This is my favorite point, y'all. This is my favorite. When we trade our authenticity in for approval, we begin hustling for our worth. And I don't know if it's because I've been working out, but when I hear hustling for my worth, I just see myself exercising and how exhausting that can be after so long, right? Like I'm a thicky, okay? I don't want to work out for 24 hours. So think about how we exhaust ourselves 24, 48, 72, like just hours on end to seek the approval of one person. Now think if that is your behavior and how much hustling you're doing for every space you go into, like work and different organizations and in your family and at church and your relationship, your personal romantic relationship and in your friendships. Whoo! Not only are you exhausted, but you have completely undone the mindset of, of being worthy. I love, 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 love this statement so much. I could probably stay here, you all. Y'all know this is one of the most popular videos in this series. Is are you hustling for your worthiness when it was it's it's a given? It's a given. No one can undo when God created you and called you worth. No one can undo that. But when we don't believe that we're worthy, we trade in the pieces of us that make us who we are. That's true about us. So that someone finds us worthy. <sighs> that someone approves of us. And even in that, when man approves of us, it's typically conditional. Oh my goodness, I gotta move on. <laughs> gotta move on. Number five, shame can't live here. Shame thrives in secrecy. So I might be jumping around on my list, but... This series has absolutely reignited, corrected, did some gut checking. I cannot deal with lying anymore. And I have told y'all in my series that I am an omitter. And I don't tell small white lies. But since I've started this series, I have no tolerance for it. And I think it's because I've been lied to. So I know how damaging it is. But also looking at it from the space of lies are typically us avoiding being vulnerable so with this one shame can't live here it only lives in secrecy 
I try to ask myself a series of questions when I feel like I'm about to lie. Um, much of which sounds like, what am I ashamed of? Do I believe that this person will leave if I tell the truth? Because then it's like, what am I afraid of? And do I believe that if I tell the truth, my worthiness in this space and in this person's eyes declines? Because now I'm hustling. And so no matter how we flip it, lying <laughs> is a it's, a, it's way bigger than just lying. And so this one just says, shame can't live here. If I'm ashamed of something, it only thrives. Shame becomes a mountain in my space if it is kept in secrecy. So this is really small, but I wanna, I wanna tell y'all this, cause you know, I told y'all, I tell y'all my business. But recently, uh, maybe I shouldn't tell that right now. <laughs> I was just thinking about it. I'll come back to it. But shame thrives in secrecy. So if there's something you're ashamed of, the way you beat it is by telling it. Telling it and knowing that it's yours to tell and that no one can make you feel bad about your truth. Okay? Number six, I am not the strong friend. I am not a strong friend. I know that this is a compliment. I have heard it. I hear it. I try to correct it every time I hear it now. I don't want to be the strong friend because being the strong friend indicates that I'm the person that has presented myself as always having it together and never needing help. In addition, it implies that if I'm the strong friend, I am deciding that someone else could potentially be the weaker friend. When in reality, the people we call weak are typically the ones who are transparent about what they're going through. They mention when they need help. Um, they typically depend on their community a lot. And based on everything I learned in this book, the weak friend, according to society, is the strong one. Because it takes strength to admit when you don't know and you don't have. It takes strength and compassion and courage to say when you need something from people and you need your community to show up. It takes strength to call a friend and say, I'm having a crappy day. Can we walk through it? I don't want to be a strong friend. Do not call me it. I will not call myself it. Let's change the language around that. We are a strong group of friends. All of us at different points in time will go through things that could make us feel um, weak or can really uh, diminish us in our spirit. And so you all are capable of building me back up as I am you. Okay. Number seven, it is a privilege to hear my deepest truths. And I have people who have earned that right whom I should tell. I think sometimes the way society works, going back to the strong friend mindset and just vulnerability, we don't think that there are people in our lives who are worthy of our truths and we miss out on great relationships, great opportunities to connect because we don't acknowledge that there are people who have put in the work who are worthy, who are trustworthy, who are um, our confidants that we can confide in about things going on. And so I'm telling myself, I do have people who have earned the right to hear my truths, my deepest ones, right? Number eight, courage equals um, when I am willing to risk being vulnerable and disappointed. Um, I mentioned during the series when I posted this video that I reached out to an old friend, um, wrote them to say that I missed them and that my, the response, like, you know, checking in, not just I miss you, but the response wasn't what I wanted. And in that moment, I had to learn it was still courageous to reach out to say, I miss you, that I don't like how things ended, that um, I think we're better than this ending, right? Um, and it's still courageous when the outcome disappoints me. I think sometimes, and I'm not, I think, I know that sometimes we dismiss our courageous acts because the outcome isn't what we wanted, right? So you shoot your shot, you get rejected. Suddenly that experience is a waste and you focus more on the rejection instead of the fact that you just did a really courageous thing and you are strengthening that courage muscle. I want to encourage you that courage is showing up, risking being disappointed while still being vulnerable. Okay? Number nine, if it's a big deal, say it's a big deal. Renee talks about how sometimes we downplay 
things that are going on in our life because we don't want to be disappointed. So it goes back to that. And what happens is our community don't our community doesn't know that they should show up. For instance, um, I have a job interview. If I'm super excited about it, instead of telling my friends I'm super excited about it, I keep it on a hush hush. If I get the job, then I celebrate. The problem with this is if my friends didn't know that I was super excited about this job and how much it meant to me, they're not going to bring the right energy to my rah, rah, let's celebrate moment. They're going to be like, okay, good job. So when we choose to um, downplay things that matter to us, we also eliminate our community from showing up for us at the capacity that we need them to. Um, even the flip side, let's say I don't get the job. I need my circle to know that this was a big deal for me. And so it would be nice to get phone calls that day. It would be nice to get affirming text messages at some point. It would be nice for somebody just to be like, I'm really sorry that happened. You're still qualified. We can't downplay it or completely dismiss it or because then they won't know how to, like they won't know at what radar they should reach out to you. Okay. Uh, number 10, the best helpers receive help judgment free. So she talks about how um, if you are someone that struggles with receiving help without pairing it with judgment, you are also someone who struggles with giving help and not pairing it with judgment. And so I really like this one because I feel like I feel like at the heart of who I am, I'm a helper. But it wasn't until she stated it that way that I'm like, do I have a judgment around people who need my help? Like, am I above asking for help? And so I really started to kind of do a heart work and I'm like, there's some pride in that. There's some judgment in that. And you have to learn to really like dismiss those things, like put them things down or you're going to miss opportunities to connect. And so there were a lot of times during this series that I would have to tell myself like, you know, you don't have this. So why don't you just ask, do it. Just like, even if you don't feel it's necessary to ask, I want you to ask so that you can exercise the muscle and you can allow your community to show up for you. You cannot be an island. God did not create us to be an island. And so that was really major. Number 11, I belong. That is one of my favorites as well. In this chapter, she talks about how when we fit in, essentially what we're doing is we are compromising who we are, what our truths are, what is our story, who, like what character traits do we have just to be able to fit into a space. But when you belong to a space, that space demands you to show up at maximum capacity. And so I want to encourage you with the same thing that she encouraged me with. And that is that we should be in spaces that we feel like we belong in, not that we're fitting in, right? So think about it like a shoe. It's either your foot fits in that shoe or it doesn't. And if it fits, that means it belongs there. You hadn't, you didn't have to bend your toes. You didn't have to get any marks on your heel. It fits, but not fit in. It belongs. This, this foot belongs in that size shoe. So you need to ask yourself, are there spaces where I'm not being completely who I am called to be? I'm not tapping into my maximum abilities. When I come, you know, my personality doesn't get to shine here because you're probably fitting in. But when you belong to a space, that space does not thrive unless you bring 100% of who you are. I love that. Love it. All right. Next one. Freedom births freedom. Authenticity births authenticity. It is a practice. So in a nutshell, the things that we want to see in our relationships, we have to first be doing it. Period. So if you feel like, you know, and it makes me think about like previous relationships where I'm like, if honesty was an issue, was I being honest? Because the reality is you, you can't be around a person who's doing things and it not cause you to do the same thing. You understand what I'm saying? Like if your circle is doing drugs, it's but so long until you're going to do drugs too. Unless you just never hang out with them anymore, which means you have removed yourself from a space that would have birthed that behavior in you. So if I'm around a bunch of happy people, it will be strange and difficult for me not to be happy. So the same goes for freedom and authenticity. If you're being completely honest in this space and I'm seeing you constantly tell me the things that's hard to say or you're owning your story, I'm going to have the freedom to do the same thing because that is what this space is cultivating. Okay. Number 13. How I love me directly reflects and impacts how I love you, period. The way we love ourselves is literally reflected in how we love other people. When you see relationships that have an imbalance or if your relationships don't seem so loving, 
I guarantee you it's because your relationship with yourself is not that loving. So something to think about. Number 14, shame versus guilt. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to read this because um, I'm still unpacking this, but I think that this is really helpful for your walk with Christ. Of course, with other people, but I remember before, before the quarantine started, I was supposed to minister um, the Thursday, the week that it happened that Thursday, I was supposed to minister. And I was going to talk about shame. And Brene says, shame needs three things, three things to grow out of control in our lives. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. When something shaming happens and we keep it locked up, it festers and grows. It consumes us. We need to share our experience. Shame happens between people and it heals between people. And so then she says, shame loses power when it is spoken. And so I love this because I think it speaks to how a lot of us struggle in our walk with Christ about where we are. So I'm not going to go into that, but I'm just giving you all the points and what really, you know, but then she says, there's a difference between shame and guilt. And so I guess, I guess I'll say a little snippet of what I'm thinking without taking too much more time. I think if we can look at the situations and things that we do or things that happen into us the right way, we will have a healthier relationship with Christ. Okay. So she says, guilt is, I did something bad. It's a positive way to look at your behavior. Okay. I did something bad. Shame is I am bad. When you did something bad, you can correct the behavior. When you feel like you're bad, it diminishes your value. And now instead of addressing the, the mistake or what you did, you now are going into a deeper place of like, like for instance, okay. Okay, cookies on the table. Guilt says, I shouldn't have eaten your cookies. And now I can go replace them. Whether you have fresh baked cookies or store bought, I can replace this. That was a bad action. I can fix it. Shame says, I'm a terrible person. I have no self-control. I'm going to, I'm going to die alone because I ate your cookies and I shouldn't have. Like it becomes so much more about you instead of the situation. And so, yes, you can buy some more cookies, but the bigger work that needs to happen here is how you see yourself. Guilt says, baby. I ate some cookies. I was hungry. I wanted to do something sweet. I'm still a great person. I'm going to go replace some cookies because that was trifling for me to do. Shame completely throws you away. Love that. Okay. Um, number 15. Numbing behaviors weaken my vulnerability muscle. So uh, really quickly, this looks like if I, and I'm mentioning this because I've talked about it on my channel. If I am having a rough day, let's say I'm going through a breakup, let's say I'm having a falling out with one of my friends, numbing behaviors can look like me going to go out to eat. Uh, if I'm falling out with a friend, me, you know, just spending a lot of time with my boo or um, it's an avoidance. Numbing behaviors is you avoiding where you need to be vulnerable and deal with those emotions that you are experiencing no matter how uncomfortable they are. So numbing behaviors weaken, weaken my vulnerability muscle. And number 16, which is a bonus, it says create because it brings you joy. I love it. In a nutshell, create because it brings you joy is about letting go of perfection, learning how to rest, letting go of comparison, and to stop boxing myself in. This series has brought me so much joy. And of course, I want it to be in the hands of everyone in the world, but I am happy doing it for myself. I'm happy have I'm happy I am happy having documented documented it <laughs> for me and for people in my community to check out whenever they enter their season of needing some type of guidance and vulnerability. And so, create. Create because you want to. Create because it's therapeutic. Create because you're gifted. Create because it's a joyful experience. Stop worrying about the likes. Stop worrying about blowing up. Stop worrying about the money. And just do it because you want to. Do it because it. you were created to create. Your creator created you to create. And so create it. And it's going to feel so good when you're done. So anyway, like this video share this video, subscribe if you haven't, and please check out my t-shirts. 
that is something I recently created and I really like them and so I would love it if you support it and purchase and wear it and take a picture and you know whatever you want to do with it but it would mean a lot to me for you to purchase some statement pieces um, of things that spoke to you and if there's something that you're like you know I think you should make this type of shirt I'm willing to create it. <laughs> I just did the well, y'all. Y'all couldn't see me. All right, y'all. I will see you all in the next video.